Well, we're exploring the book of Ezekiel, and we've set aside this evening for chapters 12 and 13. And uh, so, we need to understand as we go through this book that God was using Ezekiel not just to talk to those of Judah, those that are still over there in Jerusalem, or those that are in the second deportation with him in, in the, the uh, fields of Babylon. The possibility is that he is talking to you and me as well in terms of what? The idols we worship. I don't think most of us are kneeling down before some carved image necessarily, but if we need, we need to understand what an idol is and why it's dangerous. And uh, we also need to understand what false prophets are. Now most of you know what they are. You all have a television set. So these things are co compete for our attention. I'm going to suggest right up front that anything that distracts you from focusing on God is an idol or a false prophet. It's that broad, if you will. And uh, so we're going to really focus, uh, Ezekiel's going to focus on, the, and God's going to focus through Ezekiel on the moral necessity of the captivity. We all know about the captivity of Babylon and the three deportations, the 70 years and all of that, as, as a national catastrophe in Israel's history. But it was morally necessary, and that's what we're going to deal with. In the first uh, uh, few chapters, from cha chapters 1, 2, and 3 were his calling. Chapters 4 to 11, he had his task been to show the necessity of Jerusalem's judgment because of her disobedience. He demonstrated the fact of the siege that was coming by a whole bunch of pantomimes and strange conduct, you may recall, in those chapters. And then after entering into these strange uh, attention getters, he then explained the reason for the siege that's coming in two messages that we went through. Now in chapters 12 through 19, not just the ones tonight, but the next several of them, we're going to realize that God is focusing on the fact that people were still not ready to accept the fact of Jerusalem's fall. They had, all had an expectation this was temporary, that God was going to free them from Nebuchadnezzar. Both Jeremiah and Jerusalem and Ezekiel in Babylon were trying to get across. No, this is God's judgment. And uh, they didn't accept that. So now Ezekiel is going to give a whole new series of signs and messages. And his whole point is that any optimism here will be futile. Jerusalem's fate had been sealed. Let me skip ahead to a conclusion I think we'll draw before the evening's over, but let me put it right up front so you can measure it and consider it. You have all heard me preach from 2 Chronicles 7.14, where God appears to Solomon and states the principle, if my people who are called by my name, if they'll, do four thi if three th if they'll do four things, I'll do three. If they'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. You've, how many of you heard me? Okay. It startled me to realize that Ezekiel's message is exactly the opposite. The message that I preach typically from 2 Chronicles 7.14 is pretty much congruent with a message of the false prophets in their day. The, the, the false prophets in Jerusalem were telling the people, God's going to deliver us, it's all going to be all right, hang in there. No, just the opposite. One of the things you and I need to think about, we see the deterioration of our culture, the myth of America, the America that we knew in the 50s and 60s ain't there now, the corruption in the courts, the corruption in the mainline media, fill in the blank, we see everywhere we look. Is that temporary? Can we claim 2 Chronicles 7.14 and if, 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 it may all change? Maybe. Or are we beyond that point of no return? Are we in that point where, yes, there'll be a remnant protected, but God's judgment may already have started as we watch Katrina, as we watch the floods, the tornadoes, as we watch the bankruptcy of our Treasury Department, as we watch etc. Is it possible that the message we should be tuning into is Ezekiel's, not the one of 1 Chronicles 
2 Chronicles 7. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead here. These messages we're looking at here were in the 11 year interval between the second and final deportation. The first deportation, Daniel and a few hostages were taken. A vassal king, Jehoiakim, was put in charge. He tried to rebel. Nebuchadnezzar puts him down, puts uh, uh, the uncle in charge, Zedekiah. And it's in that group, the second age, that Ezekiel is taken at the age of 25 as one of the, the captives to, to, uh, into the Babylonian Empire. Not to the city of Babylon, but to, to a couple hundred miles away to the fields as slaves and so on. There is a third siege coming that's going to result in the destruction of Jerusalem. And these messages by Ezekiel are between the time he was deported, the second siege, and this final deportation. Okay. And we all the way through here, we're dealing with deliberate symbols, allegories, and parables. Um, and we're going to find in chapter 12, he's going to give two symbolic representations of flight from the besieged city. He's going to mimic the fact that the remainders that are in Jerusalem are going to have to flee uh, the city, the besieged city. And he's also going to deal with the false prophets of, that are active in Jerusalem. In chapter 15, which you're going to get to later next time, it pictures Israel as a useless vine. There's a whole different idiom that he's going to use. And we're going to also allegorically recall Israel's long history of unfaithfulness to her bridegroom in chapter 16. So we're in chapters 12 and 13. 14, 15, 16, 17 are together a packaged allegory we'll get into later. And when you get to 17, we're going to return the metaphor of the vine to emphasize Zedekiah's disloyalty. Zedekiah is bad news. It's interesting to discover that Nebuchadnezzar kept his word. He's a pretty good guy doing what he does. Zedekiah was shifty, didn't keep his promises. Bad scene. And then chapter 18 is going to answer objections to the idea of divine punishment. And the analysis of individual responsibility. That's going to pinch us when we get down there. Let's, and then chapter 19 will burst forth in a dirge over the princes of Judah, the leadership itself, and then of course of Judah itself. This is all a pre preamble, because after he really hammers Jerusalem and Judah in the next several chapters, when you get to chapter 25 through 32, the scene shifts to all the nations around Jerusalem, and we're going to go through an inventory of all the Muslim nations in Ezekiel. But we'll come, let's, let's get here. Chapter 12, verse 1, the word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, there's that phrase that uh, we uh, constantly see five times in this chapter alone. The word of the Lord came unto me. That's not a, a casual use of phrase. If that was used inappropriately, it was subject to the death penalty in Israel. This word of the Lord came to me. It, it, it introduces 10 of the 11 signs and uh, in chapters 12 through 19, there's one exception that I won't bother getting into here. Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. It's interesting, this idea of stopped ears and closed eyes is an idiom all through the scripture. It sounds so familiar because it shows up in Deuteronomy and Isaiah and Jeremiah and in the book of Acts. Common phrase. People don't hear because they don't want to hear. And that's the most dangerous kind. You know, there's only one barrier to truth. That It's the ultimate barrier of truth. And that's the presumption you already have it. That closes out any appeal. And uh, the result of their deafness is the result of perversity, not incapacity. They are willfully blind and deaf. Is that true today? Judge for yourself. You know, once the Pharisees accused Jesus of working his miracles by the power of Satan. Remember that in Matthew chapter 12. And from that day on, he began to withhold from them his truth. In chapter 12 of Matthew, he changes his style. For, uh, up to that point, he's been, in, 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 well, I should say in chapter 12, they accuse him of doing his things by Satan. From that point on, he never speaks in public except in parables. And they weren't to teach, they were there to hide. That sounds shocking, but read Matthew 13. It's a key, in, key insight. And, uh, from, and from that point on in public, he only spoke of parables. He only explained the parables in private. He began withholding the message from them. And that all led to the seven kingdom parables, as they're often called, of Matthew 13. 
And he, and he explained why he's speaking in parables, and he quotes from Ezekiel that hearing they won't hear, and seeing they won't see. It's a form of judgment, in effect. You and I do not want to fall into that same trap. You don't want to fall into the trap of spiritual deafness or blindness. Continuing verse 3, Therefore, son of man, prepare thee stuff for removing. That word stuff. <laughs> nothing, nothing quaint about the King James. I don't, you can't improve on that, you know. I love that thing in, in uh, Dan 5, Daniel 5, where it speaks of uh, Belshazzar. His knees smote one against the other. <laughs> you, you can't improve on that. Anyway, therefore, thou son of man, prepare thee stuff for removing. Remove by day in their sight, and thou shalt remove from thy place to another place in their sight. It may be they will consider, though they be a rebellious house. The word removing and remove is foreign to our ears, but you need to understand that in Old English, removing is the term they use for relocating, changing your address. Um, uh, and uh, so... Uh, ben Franklin is famous for quoting in Poor Richard's Almanac. He says, three removes are like a good fire. You know, if you've moved three times, that's as good as ha you had your stuff burned away. It's, it's, a remove isn't j is a term, that old, the old English term, even colonial English, of, of what we would consider relocation or moving from, plate, from address to address. So he wanted, he wanted Ezekiel to act out like he is moving. Do it during the day, doing it at night. He's trying to get across by this mimicking that that's what the people in Jerusalem were facing. Thou shalt bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight, as stuff for removing, and thou shalt go forth even at their sight as they go forth unto captivity. The people would recognize that because six years ago, they did the same thing when they were deported, you know, in the second deportation. The first action be the daytime was followed by a second action in the evening. The whole idea is to, that is to get across that this is acting out a threat that hangs over them. In other words, there's, these are symbolic to indicate they're going to be fleeing from city to city to try to avoid capture. And uh, what he's trying to do, God's trying to do through Ezekiel, is to separate them from their complacency. The lukewarmness, if I can use that term. They knew their city was under vassal rule, not, a, not their own rule. It was under a vassal king, and that vassal king was not knuckling under to Nebuchadnezzar. They had an attitude throughout the thing that it was just temporary, and things were going to get better. So they're not listening to the prophets, to either Jeremiah in Jerusalem or Ezekiel in Babylon. They're both giving the same message to their respective constituents. He tells Ezekiel, dig thou through the wall in their sight and carry out thereby. Don't use a door. Dig through the wall again. He's trying to you know, create a sense of desperation here. In their sight thou shalt bear it upon thy shoulders, carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face that thou see not the ground. Remember that phrase. It's going to be very interesting here in a minute. That thou see not the ground. For I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. He's doing this theatrically to get their attention. This isn't just something he's doing. He's doing it in a pantomime sense, if you will. Okay? And uh, he was to pretend that he was being taken captive. Dig through the wall. Carrying his belongings, you know, like, a, like a, 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 in a knapsack or something. He says, I did so as I was commanded. I brought forth my stuff. I like that phrase. By day, as stuff for captivity, and in the even, I dig through the wall in mine hand, and I brought it forth in the twilight, and I bear it upon my shoulder in their sight. And in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? In other words, he's acknowledging by this opening that the curiosity of the people have been aroused. They're watching what's going on. He got their attention. Now he can, having got their attention, he can deliver the message. Say thou unto them, thus saith the Lord God. Key phrase. Don't take that for granted. That's an authenticating phrase. Thus saith the Lord God. This burden concerneth the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel that are among them. The burden concerneth the prince. There's a play on, in the Hebrew that's been translated here, there's a play on words. Equivalent to the leader is the load. And there's a play on words there a little bit. The words are very similar. By the way, I want you to know something else. Nowhere in Ezekiel does he refer to Zedekiah as the king. He, he, he sees him as, in fact, in charge, but not legally. 
He's there because he's been appointed. He also has violated his oath of office. So, so he always refers to him as a prince, not the king. Little subtlety, but it's a form of put down by Ezekiel. In Chronicles and other places, you'll use Zedekiah as the king because he's appointed Nebuchadnezzar to be the king, but he, he ain't really as far as Ezekiel's concerned. Okay, Let's do, that raises the whole issue of Zedekiah. He was Judah's last king from about 599 to 588 B.C. He was the youngest son of Josiah, that fabulous king that preceded him and his wife. He was a brother Je Jehoahaz. He was 10 years old when his father died, 21 when he mounted the throne. So he's a young man, but he's pretty weak and crafty and, and, and devious. His original name was Medaniah. Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to Zedekiah when he deposed his nephew Jehoiachin. Okay? Now Zedekiah proves that Nebuchadnezzar treated him kindly because he allowed him to choose a new name and, and confirming it as a mark of his supremacy. Zedekiah in Hebrew means the righteousness of yod or Yahweh, or however you want to say it. So Zedekiah, the Yah, if you will. He's the righteousness of Yah. Uh, Zedek, remember Adonai Zedek, the Lord of righteousness. Zedek is righteousness, okay. And this is, Zedekiah is the righteousness of Yahweh, if you will, or Jehovah. This name was also allowed by Nebuchadnezzar to be a pledge of his righteously keeping the covenant with Nebuchadnezzar, he, who made him swear by God. In Ezekiel 17, this will come up again, in 2 Chronicles 36, you have it recorded, Zedekiah swore an oath of allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar. And he violates that. And that's what he's going to get punished for, by God and by Nebuchadnezzar. So he, uh, if he'd kept his oath of, of, of fealty, if you will, he would have been safe, but dependent upon Nebuchadnezzar. But he was weak, vacillating, treacherous. He's conniving. He's trying to make an alliance with Egypt behind the scenes. I won't go through all that here. But he brought ruin upon his country and upon himself. If he hadn't done that, Jerusalem would have been destroyed. Because of his fooling around and not keeping his word, the city of Jerusalem was leveled. It was through the anger of Yahweh, or Yod Vave, as the rabbis might pronounce it, um, against, uh, the anger of God against Judah, that Zedekiah was given up to his own rebellious devices, stiffening the neck and hardening his heart from turning to the Lord God of Israel, to, to quote it from the scripture. And uh, so he, he would not humble himself. There's lots of scripture. You can dig that on your own. We'll keep moving here. S God says, Say, I am your sign. Like as I have done, so shall be done unto them. They shall remove and go into captivity. This was his way of trying to get their attention that the people in Jerusalem were not going to be freed. They also there's going to be a third deportation, the final one. I am your sign, Ezekiel's saying. And what he does in the presence of these exiles, um, expressing what will be before long, what's going to happen there in Jerusalem, a couple hundred miles away to the west. And, uh, and the prince that is among them, there is that phrase again, shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight and shall go forth and they shall dig through the wall to carry out thereby and he shall cover his face that he see not the ground with his eyes. There that phrase is again. And uh, this refers to Zedekiah disguise. Even the king, Zedekiah, is going to disguise himself and in in, 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 in try to slip through uh, 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 some kind of new exit. And uh, in, in Jeremiah talks about, he went forth out of the city by night by way of the king's garden by the gate betwixt two walls. That's the way it's described in Jeremiah. We're going to look at it in another way here in a minute. That he see not the ground with his eyes. That turns out to be quite prophetic. You'll see in a minute here. And then verse 13. I want you to remember Ezekiel 12, 13. It's a very interesting historical phrase for a number of reasons I'll show you. God says, My net will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. That seems straightforward enough. <laughs> not so much, not so quick. He shall not see it. Josephus relates something very interesting that Ezekiel sends this prophecy to Jerusalem and Zedekiah finding an apparent discrepancy or contradiction, if you will, because one says he's going to die in Babylon, another guy says he'll never see Babylon. And he makes fun of them. You prophets can't even get your story straight. Well, let's see what happens here. Because of Jeremiah, I'm switching it, not from Ezekiel, to Jeremiah 32, verse 4 and 5, it reads, Zedekiah the king of Judah shall not escape out of the land of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him. 
mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he uh, she be till I visit him, saith the Lord, though ye fight with the Chaldeans, yet ye shall not prosper. That's a phrase from Jeremiah 32. In Jeremiah, a couple chapters later, in Jeremiah 34, thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but but shall surely be taken, delivered into his hand. Thine eyes shall behold the kings of the king of Babylon, and he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. Pretty much the same kind of phrase. There's a guy by the name of Josephus. Many of you probably have his complete works, his two major works, the Antiquities of the Jews, the Wars of the Jews. They are actually very fascinating reading. Many of us as Christians should take a little time to, to go through those. I'm going to take the liberty, something I don't normally do, but we're going to read just two little ex excerpts from Josephus just directly to get a flavor of it. This is from Flavius Josephus in his the work called Antiquities of the Jews in book number 10 and in chapter 7, starting in the second uh, section. Now Zedekiah was 21 years old when he took the government and he, the same mother and with his brother Jehoiachin, but was a despiser of justice and of his duty, for, the tru for truly those of the same age with him were wicked about him. And the whole multitude did what unjust and insolent things they pleased. For which reason the prophet Jeremiah came often to him. Joseph is writing, by the way, in the first century. He was an eyewitness to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. So he's a, he's a contemporary to the book of Acts, if you will. That's why, it's no misunderstanding, he's not inspired word of God, but he's a very interesting historian. And his histories are very, and by the way, he does speak of Jesus, by the way, but I'm going to get into that here. Um, for which reason the prophet Jeremiah came often to him, protested to him, and insisted that he must leave off his impieties and transgressions and take care of what was right. And neither give ear to the rulers, among whom were wicked men, nor give credit to those, their false prophets who deluded them, as if the king of Babylon would make no more war against him, as if the Egyptians would make war against him and conquer him, since what they said was not true, and the events would not prove such as they expected. And uh, he, see, uh, Zedekiah was constantly intriguing, trying to get the pharaoh of Egypt to back him and to get free from Nebuchadnezzar. And it doesn't cut it. Now Zedekiah himself, when he heard the prophet speak, he believed him and agreed to everything as true and supposed it was for his advantage. But when he, then his friends perverted him and dissuaded him from what the prophet advised and obliged him to do as they pleased. Ezekiel also foretold in Babylon what calamities were... See, first he was talking about Jeremiah, now he's talking about Ezekiel. Ezekiel also foretold in Babylon what calamities were coming from the people, which when they heard, he sent accounts for, of them unto Jerusalem. But Zedekiah did not believe their prophecies for the reason following. It happened that the two prophets agreed with one another in what they said, as in all other things, that the city should be taken and Zedekiah himself should be taken captive. But Ezekiel disagreed with them and said, Zedekiah should not see Babylon. While Jeremiah said to him, the king of Babylon should carry him away hither in bonds. And because they did not both say the same thing as to the circumstance, he disbelieved what they both appeared to agree in and condemned them as not speaking the truth therein. Although all the things foretold him did come to pass according to their prophecies, as we shall show upon fitter opportunity. Now the city was taken on the ninth day of the fourth month in the eleventh year of the reign of Zedekiah. They were indeed only generals of the king of Babylon, to whom Nebuchadnezzar committed the care of the siege, for he abode himself in the city of Ribla. See, we're, we've skipped, we're ahead in chapter 8 now of, of Josephus. The names of these generals who ravaged and subdued Jerusalem, if anyone desire to know them, are these. And he lists the names that I'll mispronounce if I try. Uh, and uh, on, Well, let me, uh, Nagal Serezer, uh, Sangar Nebo, Rabsaris, Sarachim, and here's the entry, Rabmag. And uh, uh, Rab Mag is the leader of the Magi, the term that the Babylonians picked up that the uh, Persians, of course, uh, used. But let's go ahead here. And when the city was taken about midnight and the enemy's generals were in entered into the temple, and when Zedekiah was sensible of it, he took his wives and children and his captains and his friends and with them fled out of the city through the fortified ditch and through the desert. And when certain of the deserters had informed the Babylonians of this at the break of day, they made haste to pursue after Zedekiah, overtook him not far from Jericho, and encompassed him about. But for those friends and captains of Zedekiah who had fled out of the city with him, when they saw their enemies near them, they left him and dispersed themselves, some one way and some another, and everyone resolved to save himself. So the enemy took Zedekiah alive when he was deserted by all but a few with his children and his wives, and brought him to the king. And when he was come, Nebuchadnezzar began to call him a wicked wretch and a covenant breaker 
and one that had forgotten his former words when he promised to keep the country for him. That is for Nebuchadnezzar. He also reproached him for his ingratitude that when he had received the kingdom from him who had taken it from Jehoiachin and given it to him, he had made use of the power he gave him against him that gave it. But said he, God is great who hateth the conduct of thine and hath brought thee under us. And when he had used these words to Zedekiah, he, get this, he commanded his sons and his friends to be slain. That's before his very eyes. And while Zedekiah and the rest of his captains looked on, after which he put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him and carried him to Babylon. And these things happened to him as Jeremiah and Ezekiel had foretold, that he should be caught, he would be brought before the king of Babylon, that he should speak to him face to face, that he should see his eyes with his own eyes, and thus far did Jeremiah prophesy. But he also was made blind and brought to Babylon and did not see it, according to the prediction of Ezekiel. So he didn't see Babylon, yet he died there. Now, why am I making a big thing of this? Well, first of all, Josephus did. It's a matter of, the, you know, the uh, awareness uh, in, the, in the early centuries. But it's also interesting because we also learn from this what we would call a hermeneutical lesson. When you deal with God, watch the fine print. God means what he says and says what he means. I never use the word approximate or about in a Bible study. If it's right, it's right on. Nothing approximate. God knows what he's doing and knows what he means. And you can go through all of this in your notes if you want to. Anyway, this leads to, we're dealing here with the siege, of course, the third deportation. And that's, uh, that terrible siege followed. So that mothers boiled and ate the flesh of their own infants. You and I cannot imagine that kind of desperation. You and I can't imagine Living in a culture where you wake up one morning, you look over the wall, and you realize you're surrounded by an enemy that's prepared to stand there. The Romans, if they were Romans, they'd stay 25 years if necessary to starve you out. They'd seal off the city. No one could go in or out. It not a matter of time before you just starved to death. Mothers boiled and ate the flesh of their own infants, and the visage of their nobles was blacker than coal, and their skin claved to their bones and became withered. The Bible is not a soft peddling book. It's rated R or worse. It's graphic. It deals with ugliness as well as beauty. It deals with the depravity of man and its remedy. On the ninth day of the fourth month in the middle of July, after a year and a half siege, from the tenth month to the ninth year to the fourth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, about midnight a breach was made in the wall. The Babylonian princes took their seats in the state in the middle gate between the upper and lower city. Zedekiah fled in the opposite direction, namely southwards, with muffled face to escape recognition like one digging through a wall to escape. Exactly what Ezekiel was pantomiming earlier. Between the two walls on the east and west sides of the Teropian Valley by a street issuing at the gate above the royal gardens at the fountain of Siloam. You can trace all this on a map of Jerusalem if you like. Zedekiah was overtaken in the plains of Jericho for judgment to Ribla at the upper end of ba uh, Lebanon. And there Nebuchadnezzar first killed his sons before his eyes and caused the eyes of Zedekiah to be dug out. That's the phrase used there in Jeremiah. Both 39 and 52 this comes up. Thus were fulfilled the apparently, I'll say ostensibly, um, inconsistent prophecies. It's interesting how often when you see an apparent discrepancy in the scripture, if you dig behind that, you make a discovery. Something that seems contradictory is actually revealing a more subtle truth. So God always rewards the diligent. God is literal. By the way, Psalm 138, verse 2 is one of the several places where God places his word above his name. It does, you don't have to read much scripture to realize God holds his name sacred. There's only one thing I know of that's more sacred than his name. And that's his word. That's his word. When Daniel read Jeremiah, who spoke of seven years' captivity, Daniel took Jeremiah literally, not allegorically, not figuratively. Whenever someone in the Bible reads the Bible, you'll notice he always, in those situations, takes it literally. Jesus, quoted from the Old Testament, he always applied it literally, never figuratively. And uh, that's, you'll, you'll always find that in your own Bible study. So I, I challenge you to take, check that out. 
Continuing uh, the same account, let's look, take a look at how it's recorded in 2 Kings. Came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came, he and all his host, against Jerusalem, pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about, and the city was besieged, unto the eleventh year of Zedekiah. Mary, there, now this, he, see, Kings uses the term king. Ezekiel does not. Now, on the ninth day of the fourth month, it was the famine prevailed in the city, and there was no bread for the people of the land. The city was broken up, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which is by the king's garden. Now the Chaldees were against the city round about. The king went away toward the plain, and the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army were scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to king of Babylon, to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him. They slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. I want to include the biblical record. I, I thought it would be interesting for us to read through the Josephus thing just for the experience. But the, it's the, always the biblical record that we lean on here. But there's a contrast here. Zedekiah was a bad dude. He was deceptive. Wicked guy. He broke his treaty with Nebuchadnezzar. He broke his treaty. You may not like Nebuchadnezzar, but he made us, he swore an oath. Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, was more honorable than the man on Israel's throne. That's the reality here. Zedekiah, for breaking his oath of allegiance, was blinded and died in captivity at Babylon. He's got, he got his just desserts. Continuing Ezekiel 12, And I will scatter toward every wind all that are about him to help him and all his bands, and I will draw out the sword after them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There's that phrase again. When I shall scatter them among the nations and disperse them in countries. You notice something strange there? Is there something strange about verse 15? Is that talking about the Babylonian period? I don't think so. I will scatter them among the nations. I personally suspect that we need to treat some of these passages the way we do the Psalms. You'll notice all through the book of Psalms, there's these little nuggets tucked away. And this is one of those. I think this is the diaspora in view. I think Ezekiel, maybe unknowingly, saw far beyond the Babylonians here. All his bands, that's the men of number, easily counted. The capture of the king would naturally be followed by the dispersion of his adherents, some of whom would call, fall by the sword, while a few, the Hebrew word there is men of number, that is easily counted, would escape to some nearby country where they might hope to find a refuge. They would have to tell their tale of shame, of course. And that's part of what God has in mind, you shall discover here, is to let some escape so that that word will get out. They'll know that Yorivate was punishing their abominations. Continuing uh, uh, verse 16 in chapter 12. But I will leave a few men of them from the sword. From the, I will leave a few men of them from the sword, from the famine, from the pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the heathen, where they come, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So the, letting some of the survivors, I'm reminded in, in warfare, a very common trick of the Turk, Turkish commandos was to slip through a place and slit every other man's throat and then slip away so, so that we build their reputation. Not all of them, but a few wake up and discover that out of 100, there were a few that were spared. Why? To get the word out. See? Interesting. God is concerned for the honor of his name. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, chapter 12, verse 17, saying, Son of man, eat thy bread with quaking and drink thy water with trembling and with carefulness. He's talking about a pantomime. He's talking about getting among his people ceremonially and doing a pantomime, eat thy bread with quaking, and drink thy water with trembling and carefulness. He's creating what I would call a pantomime of famine. And this is contrary, back in chapter 4 he did something like this there, the emphasis, the message was the food would be scarce. Here, it's the terror, not just of scarcity, of famine. There's a big difference between having a scarcity and having famine. And say unto the people of the land, Thus saith the Lord God of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and of the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with carefulness, or anxiety, if you will, and drink their water with astonishment, that her land may be desolate from all that is therein because of the violence of them that dwell therein. And the, the pantomime that Ezekiel was intended to frighten them. 
There's two different groups here. The people of the land, those are the Jews in, throughout Chaldea that have already been deported by Babylon. They're the exiles, if you will. They thought they were miserable because they were exiled from their home city. They envied those that were back in Jerusalem. They didn't know the half of it. They were well off compared to Jerusalem. Now the land of Israel, that's in contrast with the people of the land of Chaldea. So far from being fortunate as the exiles from Chaldea regard them, the Jews in Jerusalem were truly miserable. For the worst is yet ahead for them. The exiles have escaped the miseries of the siege. Yes, they're captives and they're slave laborers in Babylon, but the ones in Jerusalem are going to be uh, uh, under siege. We can, the horrors of a siege is something else. The cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste, the land shall be desolate, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Those left in, these are the, those that are left in Judea after the destruction of Jerusalem. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel saying? The days are prolonged and every vision faileth. That was a proverb that is going to be attacked here, if you will. That the days are prolonged and every vision faileth. That's exactly what you hear today by people who disparage Bible prophecy. Well, it keeps going. You know, people thought it was going to, the Lord was coming back in 1800, and they, people thought in 18, 1988, and they because they, it didn't happen, so therefore prophecy's off. That's, it, it's, it's, that's the proverbial approach here. So that's not new here. This is throughout history. That's been the cry of those who have little or no faith. That, well, the days keep going and what you said doesn't come, happen, doesn't come true. And that's, you can find that all through the Scripture. Well, there's a surprise coming. See, it's going to again be the characteristic of the end times when faith will be regarded as an antiquated thing seeing that it remains stationary. Same thing in Luke 18. Will the Lord, when the Lord comes back, will the Lord find faith on the earth? See, worldly arts and sciences progress, and when the continuance of all things from creation, that's going to be, the fact that things go like they've always been is an argument against the possibility of their being suddenly brought to a standstill by the Creator. And that leads to another paradox I want to get at here, by the way. See, the very long-suffering of God should be a blessing that should lead us to repentance, that He's that patient, He's given us an opportunity. It shouldn't be twisted to be an argument against His truth. The fact that He hasn't judged us, praise God, we've got some time yet. The fact that He, does, he hasn't judged us yet doesn't mean He ain't going to. That's the point, I guess I'm trying to get it. And we're gonna, we'll pick up some more of this here in a minute. Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. For there shall be no more any vain vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. The days are at hand. Their, Israel's time is up, and the question we need to think about ourselves is ours. Is the time for America over? For years, I've preached 2 Chronicles 7.14. But I have the uncomfortable feeling, a tentative feeling, not a final conclusion, but I'm beginning to strongly suspect that we've crossed over, that we had a chance. That doesn't mean it's over for us. What we each need to do is find out what God has called us to and get about doing it. You say, gee, we're running out of energy. We're running out of food. No. We're running out of time. We're running out of time. Chapter 13 is going to elaborate on verse 24. We'll get there in a minute. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall no more be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word, and will perform it, saith the Lord. I somehow hear Yule Brenner saying, so let it be written, so let it be done. <laughs> You and I are also, I believe, running out of time. One of the frequent thoughts that runs through my mind, and it comes up in a number of places I've been lately, is uh, why are there tears in heaven? In heaven there's no death, no sin, no sickness, no lack of knowledge of God, 
Go through a whole list of things there, right? God will wipe away the tears of their eyes. Great. Why are there any tears at all? Why are there going to be tears in heaven? And I think there's only one conjecture that I have. I think what we'll be weeping over is lost opportunities. When we're before the judgment seat of Christ and our life is portrayed before us and the rewards are given out for those that are faithful and all of that, I think many of us, most of us probably, are going to be overwhelmed as we realize the opportunities we've wasted or lost. As we look back at our lives, we think about the times that we just wasted, spent precious days doing nothing of consequence. When we could have been doing something for our king, we could have been showing, showing some kind of diligence, some kind of faithfulness in this little boot camp we call life, which is nothing but a boot camp for heaven. Our eternal destiny is going to be determined by how we use the opportunities before us now. Oh, I think if we somehow can get now what I call a kingdom perspective, I think it, it's a whole, we've got some time left. You can't do anything about yesterday. And tomorrow is just a hope. Your critical day is today. What are you doing for him today? No more prolonged, he says. I want you to notice how he dwells on the word prolonged, as though he had specially stirred his indignation. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he prophesieth of the times that are far off. See, the next best thing, if you deny prophecy, is say, well, it's so far off, who knows? You know, it's way off. Well, they thought Jesus was coming back in pick an age. You know, they always did. That thus they assume he's not going to come back next week. They may be in for a surprise. See, the first proverb, there's two proverbs being addressed. The first proverb attacked by Ezekiel expressed the people's doubt about the fact of God's judgment. Is God really going to judge? The second proverb expresses the doubts about the imminency of the God's judgment. And, there's no, and, and uh, so we'll get to that. Therefore say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken will, shall be done, saith the Lord God. Prolonged any more. False prophets have been contradicting God's true messengers in Jerusalem, in Je Jeremiah 28, and in Babylon, Jeremiah 29. False prophets have been contradicting God's true messengers throughout history. And they are today on your radio and TV. Their optimistic predictions would soon cease as God hastened to fulfill His word. The word eminence, that word spelled differently means different things, of course. And what we're talking about here, see, there is, is, it's the next, it, it can happen at any moment. That's what it means by it's eminent. There's no intervening conditions required. And these are mechanisms by which one tries to intellectually or somehow get out from under the scope of some prophecy. Well, it's later. Oh, the church is going to go through the tribulation. It's not going to be a rapture before there. All these kinds of ideas. It's clear from your study of the Scripture, especially the New Testament, that Jesus Christ wanted us to be in a position of moment-by-moment -moment expectation. He instructed us to expect Him at any moment. In the next 10 seconds, next 10 minutes, before you get home tonight. That's the idea. That's what he wanted us to, to, to have that attitude. That's what we call the doctrine of eminence. Many good scholars don't accept that. But I think it's so clearly taught, it's not re really debatable. We tend to stay closer to him if he might drop in on us at any moment. I want to just depart here for a moment and take a look at 2 Peter 3. There's some very interesting insights in Peter's letter. He says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Are there people you know that are doubters of Bible prophecy? Sure. They're not, that's nothing new. Where's the promise of his coming? Here's the surprising aspect of this. 
Here's the rebuttal to prophecy. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Did you realize that the concept of evolution is ungodly for a number of reasons? Not just because it doesn't explain origins. There's, there's a deeper issue here. Someone that believes in evolution is denying the idea that a supreme being is intruding in history. Creation and prophecy are linked by the understanding that God intervenes in history. He intervened to create it in the first place, and he's going to intervene to end it, in effect. Those that want to deny his judgment that's coming need to find some way of explaining things without his intervention. Well, it all just happened. Well, first there was nothing, and then it exploded, the Big Bang, whatever. See, there is an essential requirement to understand that you and I are not here by some cosmic accident. We're here by someone's deliberate design, and the designer has an accountability that's going to come home to roost. That's the issue. People that deny prophecy, people that deny creation, are people that are trying to escape accountability by denial. They're scoffing at prophecy. There's many different ways to deny a truth. One way say, yea, hath God said? Did he really say that? That's one approach. Another is, is that was, that's not what God meant. That he really didn't mean it literally. He meant it spiritually or some other fuzzy concept. That's called liberalism. I'm not being facetious. That's what liberalism is. It's not tolerance. It's being intolerant of anybody else's view. First of all, there's an expression of skepticism about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Notice, for this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. See, one thing that's not obvious until you study this passage carefully is that there's a link between prophecy and creation. The concept that God intervenes in man's history. Man's history did not just happen by random events of the cosmos. We teach our kids that they're random accidents and then wonder why we have Columbine High School. Why they have no sense of destiny. How could they have if they're just some kind of cosmic accident? Who cares? God created man. The concept of God creating man is consistent and part of the concept that God will also intervene in history. God cares. He's involved. You are not an accident. That brings us to chapter 13. Chapter 12 denounced the false expectations of the people. This chapter is going to denounce the false leaders who fed those expectations. The false prophets. There's two classes of them. Those that were re representative of some object of worship other than the true God. Balaam, Moloch, and you name it. Elijah's contest with Baal is a good, is a dramatic example in 1 Kings 18. The second kind of those who falsely purported to speak in the name of yod -Heh Two kinds. Those that are occultic directly, those that are cults. Occult and cults. You see the difference. Cults are those that claim to be Christian and are not. Occults are unabashedly non-Christian. The occult. That's spooky stuff. That's, we call that the occult. Cults are a term used technically here for those that claim to be Christians and are not. Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons. You can go through a list. All I'm saying is that their beliefs are not biblical. And there's examples of that. Some of the strongest denunciations of false prophets come from Jeremiah. He opposed them not just on intellectual grounds, on moral, personal, and political grounds. And during the dying gasp of Jerusalem, Hananiah, false prophet, opposed Jeremiah at home. Ahab, Zedekiah, different head of Zedekiah, not the king. There were three different Zedekiahs. Don't get them confused. Zedekiah and Shemaiah opposed him in Babylon. Zedekiah, the prince or the king, was in Jerusalem. There's also a Zedekiah running around in Babylon, son of Messiah, the son of a, he was a, a false prophet in Babylon among the captives, if you will. There's also another Zedekiah, Son of Jeneah, a false prophet in the days of Ahab at a different time. But, so don't let the word Zedekiah throw you. It was, not, a, it was unusual, not an unusual name. Ezekiel in this chapter also exposed the false prophets and the false prophetesses. It's the only place I know of where it really deals with the women. 
At the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say unto them that prophesy, <coughs> prophesy out of their own hearts. Prophesy out of their own hearts, not out of the Spirit, out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. That's critical. The sin of men denounced was that they prophesied out of their own hearts and followed their own spirit instead of yod heh vav that's the, that's the error that's being emphasized here. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. There's a stronger phrase in the Hebrew. Here it's translated foolish prophets. It's a little stronger in the Hebrew. It's the, the prophets, the fools. And there's also a play on words here. Nabim is the spokesman of prophets, and Nabalim is foolish, senseless fool. So there's sort of a, a, a play on words going on here. Another way you could have translated it is the prophetless prophets. You see, that, that comes close to doing the same kind of play on words in English. But anyway, that's, I mentioned it's not that it's that important, but we're missing by translation all these subtleties through the thing. And that's why you never want to deal with a paraphrase. You want to deal with the best translation you can, and even that, get in behind it if you can. So, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Foxes? What's all that about? Well, a fox is cunning, Luke 13. It's applied to Herod Antipodus. It spoils the vine and its fruits, Song of Solomon. Israel being the vineyard in Proverbs uh, Psalm 80 and also Isaiah 55. The fox burrows among the ruins in several places. So the false prophets here are liked, likened to uh, uh, foxes, which are looked at idiomatically as spoilers. We think they're cute and have other feelings maybe, but they're used biblically as cutting intruders that are ruinous, if you will. And uh, so these false prophets made their prophet out of the ruin of Israel and made that ruin even worse. And so... Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle of the day of the Lord. And uh, this day of the Lord term here appears to be the coming judgment by the Babylonians, but it may have a broader application in some other ways here. And into the gaps. This verse really mixes two images. The breaches in the wall on the one hand, and the fact that the False prophets hadn't repaired those breaches, if you will. Both are true here. You have not gone up into the gaps, neither, and so forth, uh, and made up the hedge. So hedge is a term really from Isaiah 5, the hedge around the vineyard that's intended to protect the vineyard. It had been broken through, and they'd done nothing to repair it. That's the, the thought that lies behind this. The day of battle, the day of the Lord had come, and they were betraying the people instead of helping them. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, the Lord hath not sent them. See, they were saying, the Lord, hath, the Lord saith, the Lord hath not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they, could, they would confirm the word. Lying divination, to gain knowledge of secret things by some superstitious means. That was forbidden in Israel. It was a capital crime. To cast a horoscope in Israel was a capital crime. Think about that. It's not just a plea against silly ignorance. No, these things are dangerous. And that's why they were forbidden. Dividing in general was disparaged. Have ye not seen a vain vision, and have ye not spoken a lying divination, whereas ye say, The Lord hath said it, albeit I have not spoken? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, there's that phrase again, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now there's a lot in here. Uh, he's talking about my people. Seven times in this chapter, it's my people. He is so hostile to the false prophets because he regards those people as dear to him, and the false prophet are cheating them and betraying them, confusing them. That's why he's so angry about it. And they shall, uh, neither shall it be written in the writing. He's con con contemplating here a new register in which their names will never appear. Interesting. Threefold punishment. In the new kingdom, they shall not be in the assembly of my people. They shall not be enrolled in the register of the list. And... Uh, he apparently he contemplates a whole new register here, interestingly enough. And neither shall they enter the land of Israel. So they're going to be dispossessed of their inheritance. Because even because they have seduced my people saying, peace, there was no peace. 
And one built up a wall and no others daubed it with untempered mortar. They built up a wall and they didn't put mortar, they put plaster. So it looks like it's been solid, it's not. It's a, it's a form of, uh, it's, not, it's, it's, just, it's just plaster. A wall. The word in the Hebrew means a false or thin wall, like a party wall, a temporary partition kind of thing. The prophets were, the false prophets were compounding Israel's difficulties by hiding problems that needed to be exposed. That's the part of the concept here. Say unto them which doubt it with untempered mortar, it shall fall. There shall be an un overflowing shower in ye, and a great hailstone shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. That wall is not going to hold, in other words. Untempered mortar. The word is untempered, unseasoned, and um, it's plaster, not mortar. It's in, the technical terms in the Hebrew imply that Ezekiel was acquainted with the technical vocabulary of his time, interestingly enough. And lo, when the, fall, uh, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing wherewith ye daubed it? The wall, there's that same word again. And uh, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it down to the ground, so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and ye shall, con it shall, and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof. Ye shall know that I am the Lord. He's speaking both physically, but also spiritually here. There's that wall again. Ye shall be consumed in the midst of it. The prophets were buried. The false prophets were buried in beneath, under the, the collapsing walls. And it's described in the scripture. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar. And I will say unto you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To it, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem and which see visions of peace for her. Where, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. Remember 1 Thessalonians 5? I see several of you already pointing, you're recognizing that. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 1 Thessalonians 5.3. 5, it's an echo of the same concept here that's yet future. Second Peter also deals with these false prophecies. There will be false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately will bring in damnable heresies, even... Denying the Lord that bought them. That's the ultimate heresy, isn't it? And bring upon themselves swift destruction. You know, it's a shock to realize how many pulpits on television elsewhere deny the Lord that bought them. Oh, Christ was a great teacher. He was this, that, and the other thing. But there's no mention of his substitutionary death. That he died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the core gospel according to Paul in First uh, uh, Corinthians 15, first four verses. Continuing here, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You know what really gets to me is people who are not Christians who speak of being a Christian as somehow being uh, contributing to our problems. I can remember, you know, times in our country's history where people may not have believed Christians, but they didn't disparage them. They may have thought they were naive or following something they didn't, but, but they didn't make, you know, there were even gangsters that had a hesitation at injuring a nun or a priest, not because they're religious, they just had a kind of respect, even though they didn't buy what they were selling. You follow what I'm saying? We live in an age where being a Christian is looked upon as being the source of all our problems. Interesting. Through covetousness they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Ooh. Let's continue with Ezekiel 13. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people. Uh-oh, we're speaking to the girls now. Daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. Daughters of thy people. This is, to my awareness, the only Old Testament passage where God speaks out specifically against false women prophets. Yes, there were individuals like Jezebel and stuff, but I'm, just as a class, this is the only place we're speaking of. Uh, there are obviously many gifted women referred to in the Scripture as prophetesses. Let's make that record here. Miriam in Exodus 15, Deborah in Judges 4, fabulous people. Isaiah's wife in Isaiah 8, Hulda the prophetess is where Josiah got most of his leading. Why? Because the, the Levites had taken the Ark of the Covenant down under the protection of Pharaoh and Echo. 
And Anna the prophetess in Luke, we see. And the four daughters of Philip in Acts uh, 21. In the next section, the prophetesses, or I should really call them sorceresses, were counterparts of the false prophets, but women. Forerunners of the modern psalmists, fortune tellers, mediums, you name it. And I guess most of you, are, you can do your own history lesson. How many of the false cults, not just the occult, the Alice Bailey stuff, but the cults were founded by women. Interesting. It's just a thing we need to be aware of. But Ezekiel continues, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature, uh, statue, stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will ye save the souls alive that come to you? Now, the sew pillows to armholes is a, a, a clumsy translation. At the same time, experts aren't sure exactly what it's alluding to. The word kaseth, it really refers to covered amulets, false phylacteries, if you want to put it in a Judaical sense, that were used by the false prophetesses to support their demonic fortune-telling schemes. Whether it was palm reading or carrot cards, it's that kind of uh, illusion that's involved here. And uh, kerchiefs on the head really refers to veils that they would endow you with. Mechpacha, a long veil in effect. And uh, the sources imputed a magic influence upon their inquirers by tying knots of different kinds and shrouding the persons in veils varying length according to their stature. All these gimmickry that somehow was supposed to have magical uh, implications. Ezekiel continues, Will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread? I mean, that's what they're getting paid by. To slay the souls of those that should not die, to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies? Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against your pillows wherewith ye hunt souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms, and will, you, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Even though we're a little unclear on the specific implementation of things, you get the idea against your pillows and so forth, against your lying ceremonial tricks by which you cheat people. It's another way of phrasing that. Your kerchiefs also will I tear and will deliver my people out of your hand. They shall no more be in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Because you're the, with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthen the hands of the wicked that should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. In other words, they're undoing all that should be done. Therefore you shall see no more vanity nor divine divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Boy. God will indeed bring false prophets to the end. You can find similar passage in Amos, Micah, Zechariah, in which God takes after each of them. Very eloquently, we don't have time to go into all those. The good news in all of this, though, is that his people are delivered in spite of the false prophets. The things would be so dark that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Oh, I love that, if it were possible. I take comfort behind that exclusion. The prophet now turns to the wickedness of those who inquired of God, but whose hearts were with their idols. All now we're shifting to idol worship specifically, and this raised the problem of general responsibility. We're just looking, this is a glimpse ahead of what comes in next session in chapter 14 and following. The problem of responsibility. The presence of a righteous man among sinful people will not save a land when God brings his judgments upon it. That seems to be the message of chapter 14, verse 12 to the end of that chapter. So, we've whipped through some pretty tough material here. In our next session, I want you to read the next three chapters. Chapter 14, 15 is a little one of just eight verses, so don't let that scare you. But let me not deceive you. Verse six, uh, chapter 16 is 63 verses. <laughs> so we might not make it all the way through 16 next time. But our, we want, actually, verses, uh, all through verse 17 is a composite allegory of the history of Israel. 
But we'll just take it, we eat the elephant one bite at a time, we'll go through it verse by verse, 14, 15, and we'll get as far as we can through 16. What we don't we'll get, we'll pick up in the following session. So that's, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.